Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Bitcoin Way podcast. I'm your host, Michael Jordan. I appreciate you being here. Just wrapped up a great conversation with Stephen Lupka of Swan Bitcoin. Stephen is an awesome guy, very fun, lots of energy. He has, besides his passion in Bitcoin, a love for walking and sun exposure. We talk a little bit about that at the beginning, have a good time. I mean, this guy is walking so many steps a day and got into Bitcoin, what he is seeing with this bull run at Swan, the sorts of clients he's onboarding, what institutional adoption looks like. We're talking a lot about uh, the ETFs and everything going on there. Really had a lot of fun. We covered so much ground. I had so much fun talking to Steven. I hope we get him on again soon. And I think you'll enjoy this one. All righty, everyone. As I said in the intro, I've got Stephen here with me, the man who gets more sunshine than the Sahara. Stephen, how you doing? <laughs> hey, man. I'm well. It's great to be here. Excited to do this. Yeah. Well, hey, let's jump right into the fun stuff. We we have so many things we could talk about, but besides Bitcoin, you have two online reputations, uh, some extracurriculars in which you like to engage, yeah. walking and sun exposure. Yeah. So I, I I think I'd missed this on your your Twitter profile, but I think it said 350 miles a month. Is that correct? Yeah. So it's probably it's probably more like 300 right now. Um, but for it's actually funny the, the, when we're in a bull market, I walk more. And so it started ticking up again. So on the upper end, I'll do like 12 and a half miles a day. Uh, and then, you know, on the lower end, it's maybe nine. Um, but uh, during the bull market, because of my work, like a lot of what I do is take phone calls with clients. I just, you know, talk with people. And so, you know, I could sit down and take those calls, but I just walk. And, you know, when, when Bitcoin gets going and activity picks up, it's like, it's a lot of phone calls and I get a lot of steps in. That's unbelievable. Yeah. So how, how did you, and you live in Florida, right? So lots of sunshine too. So you're, you're getting sun exposure as you're doing that. Uh, where did these hobbies or uh, like uh, not hobbies, where did these passions come from? Cause you yeah. talk about this stuff. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah. So when I was, I think 19, um, I started like, I, I started walking a little bit. Like I had never really kind of walked much before then. And um, I had gotten kind of into some like audiobooks and my kind of intellectual curiosity was, I don't know, like you're young, right? And you go through school and you're kind of put through a meat grinder of conformity. And I felt like I kind of, you know, came out the other side and I was this like kind of young adult and there, you, you start reading things for the first time. And I felt like it was a moment in my life where kind of my intellectual curiosity was opened up. And I was like amazed by all these things in the world that I'd never thought of before while I was in high school or whatever. And so I started just walking a lot and like contemplating those things and thinking about it and audiobooks and like different things. And um, I uh, noticed I just, you know, not, not like, not like 10 miles or anything, but I, I would take walks. Like I started taking walks and I just noticed that I would feel so much better. Like it just, it made a, it made a material difference in my well being, my energy levels. Like I, I wouldn't have said it like this at the time, but I just noticed I felt better when I, when I walked and, um, I've really just done it ever since. Um, not, not at that, like the current pace, like definitely, um, you know, those numbers got larger over the years. Um, but I just continued to realize over and over again, it was just became a, a habit, just a habit, an interest, and later a passion of mine. First, I just did it. And then I realized like, it's essential. I actually think it's, it's astoundingly fundamental to literally being human. And that may sound kind of like a grandiose claim, like, like defining what it is to be human by that. But if you look at how humanity came into itself, whether evolutionarily or culturally, or just like what that long trajectory of history looks like, um, we walked. I mean, we, we, we are born to walk, like we are bipedal, our whole structure is rooted around that, our, you know, survival was rooted around that. And you even look at uh, the evidence of how the brain developed, not just in humans, but in all animals, you can see that in the earliest, most prototypical brain structures, 
um, it does one thing at the, in these kind of very simple organisms. The brain only does one thing. It doesn't process like sight. It doesn't have complex thought. It governs movement. At the basic level, what a brain does is move. And that's like the core architecture of like the protocol that everything else is built around. And so the idea that A, one could simply ignore the demands of movement or B, that one could separate the influence and need for that on everything else that comes after it. If you look at any structure in the body, whether it's like, you know, so joints, right? Like shoulder joint, elbow joint, um, they have deeper functions and more superficial functions. So barring the spine, the deepest function of every joint in the body is actually rotation. It is actually rotating. And then you have, you know, elevation, depression, protraction, uh, retraction, et cetera, are built on top of those very core and deep joint structures. Um, and so like if people are having uh, joint issues, a lot of the times you need to restore the rotational capacity prior to some of these like, oh, I can't, you know, raise my arm above my head or whatever. Um, and I think I think movement is similar to that. Uh, I think it is like a core foundational input to the way our systems work. And when that isn't present, everything, everything just works worse. And when that is present, it improves everything. And there are many studies to back this up. Um, obviously, many people are familiar with that like walking is good for your health. Uh, actually, it's ridiculously good, like astoundingly good, like almost I didn't believe it when I read it. But let's say somebody gets 17,000 steps a day. That's probably like eight miles. They would be better off on a net mortality basis starting to smoke regularly tobacco rather than walking 6,000 steps a day. The net positive impact of that 10,000 additional steps on an, on an aggregate population basis outweighs the net negative impact of smoking. Crazy. That is um, it's wild. It's ridiculously good. But my, my core argument for people is like, yeah, you probably already know it's good for your health. Like, oh, like move more, walk. Of course, it's not gonna be bad for you. But there's actually much more kind of interesting research that it improves cognitive performance. It improves creativity. It improves output. It improves emotional regulation. It improves, as I've said, these higher order functions, my theory when the base is healthy, the outer functions work better. So even these kind of like more abstract uh, cognitive properties of our lives, I think are actually like dramatically improved by, by walking. And, you know, one other thing is that, you know, you look at a lot of like, you know, high achievers, people that made a huge impact on the world. Steve Jobs would always take walking meetings. He would have people go on walking meetings, like many, many kind of luminaries, uh, pounded the table on it. And I think it's worth pounding the table on. Yeah. I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense. It's, it's funny. All this stuff that you're saying seems very obvious and, and sort of intuitive when you, when you just yeah. hear it, but it wasn't until after learning about Bitcoin for me that I kind of went like you, the Bitcoin rabbit hole, like it's deep and it's wide. Like there are yes. all these, these, mm -hmm. uh, you know, tributaries and you, you start getting, you start walking and you start getting more sun exposure. You start eating more meat and less of other things, all these, yeah. all these things. Um, I, I think like my kids, I have three kids and they will like that. We never eat vegetables, which seems like an insane thing to say, but like, you know, we have, I have my reasons for that. Yeah. Never going to put sunscreen on them ever again. I did that for a couple of years for the first two and uh, we're, we're done with that. So why do you think it is that a lot of this starts with Bitcoin for yeah. for these people. What, you know, what, are the, what are the commonalities that these belief systems or sort of worldviews have? I think there's two directions to it. I think it either starts with Bitcoin and moves outward or people that already have some of these interests discover Bitcoin. So I think, A, it can go in both directions. But the commonality is that I think if it starts with Bitcoin, if everything I believed about money wasn't true, I wonder what else isn't true, mm -hmm. right? Like that's, I think what happens, it's like there's this disruption of this uh, 
deeply held, assumed understanding of how the world works. And it's like the crack where the light comes in of like, wow, if everything I believed about that uh, might not be true, I'm now more interested and motivated to investigate the world for myself. And mm -hmm. consequently, if it's the other direction, I think it's that people, Bitcoiners as a group, I think the main trait that they share is that they are willing and want to investigate the truth for themselves. That is their orientation. I don't care what I'm being told by the aggregate masses of society. I'm going to evaluate this question on my own. And that doesn't mean that that approach is free from pitfalls or that Bitcoiners sometimes don't end up believing batshit stuff, right? Like, you know, that's the risk. But the reward is the pursuit of truth. Makes makes a lot of sense. So let me I, let me diverge then from where I wanted to go with this because I think that that brings up an interesting topic. I think your early adopters of Bitcoin, everything you said rings true. But eventually, we yeah. optimally we want this to be a network that benefits eight billion people. What do you think the path is to go from libertarian, prepper, carnivore, you know, t type people to mainstream? Like, is it is it just we have to experience enough pain and then we we the early adopters present the solution? Or how, like, how, how do you get your grandma who doesn't care about anything that you've talked about, isn't skeptical of government onto Bitcoin, I guess is kind of like, how does this happen? Yeah, so Bitcoin has to present um, a reason for its value that isn't skepticism of government, right? Like mm -hmm. if grandma isn't skeptical of the government, I don't think the answer is let's make grandma skeptical of the government. Mm -hmm. It's, hey, how does Bitcoin benefit people who are not skeptical of the government? And there's a, I think there's a strong case there, right? Like you don't and, uh, you know, this is something I talk with, you know, the guys on my team about all the time, because we're having conversations with people from all walks of life. And uh, I often say, like, look, you need to communicate this in a way that makes sense for the person you're talking to, not for you. You might value it for X or Y reason that you're, you're worried about hyperinflation or you're, you know, you just think people have a inherent right to own their own assets and I'd agree with, you know, that's totally reasonable. But if that isn't something that makes sense to the person you're talking to, you're not going to get anywhere by talking about it. Like, so, you know, what is the, what's the other, you know, what's the other narrative use case for Bitcoin? And it's there. There's plenty of, it's going to benefit our energy technology. It's going to facilitate global commerce. It's going to protect people in third world nations from, you know, I, th I think even grandma who's not skeptical of government is skeptical of like corrupt governments, you know, mm. in, in sub-Saharan Africa or whatever, right? Like right. those are different belief systems. Um, but, you know, it's going to protect people that end up in, uh, you know, corrupt regimes. It's going to provide property rights to the world. It's going to, you know, maybe provide a new monetary standard that improves uh, human economic flourishing, right? Like, I, I think Bitcoin is actually like a very optimistic thing. And I was just having this conversation earlier because I feel like there's these two camps. There's kind of like, there's like the doomers and the like, you know, the dollar is going to hyperinflate to zero in five years. And then there's this kind of other side that it's like, it's path dependent. There's so many ways this could play out. Like any assumption that like, you know, if there's any quality that like totally centralized print money from thin air systems have, it's the arbitrary capacity to spin up new buffers and rolls, right? Like that's what we've seen with the Fed is like they can always spin up some new fucking financial alchemy, be bank term funding program, like, you know, they can always print money into every recession, right? Like in many ways, like uh, I'm not saying it's a desirable trait in a monetary system, but it's elasticity and dynamism, like gives them a lot of toolkits to kick the can down the road. And that's what's happened is the can is, has been kicked for a long time. So mm -hmm. I think it's incredibly path dependent because of that. I think it's astonishingly like there's a hundred different ways it could go, you know? Maybe that's one of the ways, but there's plenty of others. And so, you know, maybe, maybe, um, so anyway, but I, so there's this kind of tension between, I think more of this, like, uh, it's all going to crash down and soon 
and this kind of more optimistic, uh, I think, view that's like, it doesn't really matter. And Bitcoin's good whether there are dollars or not. Yeah, yeah. It's it's so it's something I've been trying to think through is like, as the, the Bitcoin ETFs have come online, you, you know, like how do you articulate the value of owning the asset itself and not the ETFs? And wow. I've been like trying to sort of work through this mentally. Like if you think, if you're going to buy an ETF, it means that you think the price of Bitcoin, the value of Bitcoin is going up. Yeah. And Bitcoin going up is because there is a weakness in this dollar or fiat currency that you're chasing. And so wouldn't it therefore make more sense just to own that asset? Because all you're doing is accumulating more of a weaker asset by betting on the thing that might replace this weaker asset that you, you know it's it's kind of an odd paradox i yeah. understand institutionally it's it's you, there's an on ramp right i mean like I, you know there's a lot of question marks as to how you custody and, and what you do with actual with real bitcoin yeah um Absolutely. but yeah it, it's it's like it's like this thing i've been i've been trying to piece together i'm curious to hear from your perspective well maybe maybe before we get straight to the etfs talk a little bit about your role, talk about Swan, what you do. And uh, I'm sure that'll bring up a lot, a lot of good questions. Yeah, absolutely. So I lead the private client team for Swan. Um, we're, by my estimation, the largest concierge service in the Bitcoin industry. We work with thousands and thousands of high net worth investors, uh, helping them on, you know, in a kind of a white glove way, one on one calls, consultations, navigate Bitcoin, navigate their investment journey, their portfolios, self custody, inheritance, all of these different things. And, you know, what we've learned is, you know, that's a service that investors want. They, they want that relationship. They want that person to pick up the phone and call. And with so many landmines strewn about the path, right? You know, you you get into Bitcoin and it's so easy to, you know, oh no, I accidentally put all my money into a monkey JPEG, you know? Um, these things happen to most people, right? And so there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of benefit in like working closely with somebody that knows the industry well. And, you know, if you need to set up a trust or a business account, you have retirement assets, you have, you know, we, we do multi-sig now, um, just really making it easy for people so they can go on board from zero to more than zero, you know, with the least amount of headache and, and you know, run into the least pitfalls as they navigate this. So, um, it's been, you know, it's been an incredible ride. I run the team. I've run the team since day one. I, I built that side of the company along with, you know, everyone else that came to work on it later. And, um, it's been, uh, it's been amazing. I mean, Swan's been, uh, you know, I, I think I was like, a, like, you know, early, you know, one of the first 20 employees and, you know, we're like over 160 employees now. It's been an awesome, awesome journey. Very cool. Yeah. Good for you. So, in terms of your, your services. So like might some, if someone says, Hey, like I want to get into this Bitcoin thing, I, I keep hearing about this, but I'm going to keep a fiat portfolio. Is that yeah. something you help with? Or are you like, are you like a, a financial advisory wing or is it you're, you're only helping them with their Bitcoin allocation or? Yeah. I mean, so we're not, we're not like, Oh, okay. Put 20% in Bitcoin and then we're going to go buy NVIDIA, right? Like we're not making recommendations on other assets or anything like that. I mean, we definitely, you know, can help clients navigate. Well, you know, how much should I put in Bitcoin or how should I think of, should I do this allocation? Is this too risky for me? Like those sort of questions, you know, we definitely can provide some broad guidance on, uh, you know, like obviously, and, you know, despite what Twitter says, uh, you know, if you've got someone's uh, 90 year old grandma and they come to you and they're living off their retirement assets and they sell 4% of their retirement assets every year uh, and there's not a huge buffer there, like maybe going all in Bitcoin isn't the right move for that individual, right? Like that does, you know, convey some real risk that even if Bitcoin continues to go higher and bounces back, like that person's portfolio probably can't tolerate an 80% drawdown. Um, so, you know, those are, those are definitely conversations we have, but we're, we're certainly not making recommendations on securities for the, so for the typical client that you're on board in today or, you know, over the last couple of years, what, like what sort of, how, how meaningful is their allocation to Bitcoin? Are these like, 
people who are pretty serious have done the work or are these people who are like, yeah, I want to put a out, set aside a percentage or, you know, what, yeah. what's sort of typical. I think we've got plenty of people <laughs> that are in that double digit percentage, you know, 20%, 30%. So these are people with material allocations, you know, we obviously have clients that are like all in, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not saying we don't have uh, kind of true believers. Um, but you know, I, I think for the average person, like a 30% allocation is a huge, like that's a huge allocation, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, considering most people I know have a 0% allocation and have still not reached out to ask me questions, even in exactly. the recent bull run. So well, speaking of the recent bull run, what's what, so, I mean, what's today, the, the 20, I want to answer March. your ETF question. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Let's go back to ETFs. Yeah. So here's the reason, uh, <clears throat> do you want to pay fees once or every year? That's the first mm, question. Mm. And these are exponential fees. Let's be clear, right? Like you could pay a buy fee and buy Bitcoin, whatever that fee is. Okay. You know, let's say it's 1%. Uh, you have $100,000. You pay a 1% fee. That's $1,000. Okay, fine. You buy the ETF. Okay. It's, you know, $300 a year. Um, but then what happens if Bitcoin goes up, right? Like, that's why you're owning it. You think it's going to go up. Let's say it does a five X. Now that same fee is $1,500 a year, every year. It's more than, so the better Bitcoin does, the more that fee grows exponentially. And so instead of just paying, it's kind of like a Roth IRA, right? Like you pay tax on the seed, not the harvest. Mm -hmm. So with a one-time buy fee, you pay tax on the fiat amount and all the gains are yours. Whereas with the ETF, the better you do, the more they take uh, in, in fiat terms. Uh, so that's one thing. And the other thing is like, how would you estimate the potential future value of the total sum of all financial applications built on top of Bitcoin over the next 20 years? Do you think there will be economic value? Are you going to be able to earn revenue by doing lightning routing liquidity? Are there going to be reputable liquidity provisions, lending or, you know, highly regulated institutions going to facilitate overnight repos for Bitcoin? Like, like, can you get, can you earn a 6% rate of return off your Bitcoin if you participated some in that? Like, are there, you know, totally decentralized things? Like, I don't know. I don't know what the future is going to bring, but if you were to like, ask me to assign a percentage, that somebody who owns actual Bitcoin will be able to, in a non Celsius, non three arrows, like FTX way, earn a rate of return on those coins at some point in the next 20 years, I would say that's a 98% chance. That's definitely mm -hmm. going to happen. Um, and so if you have ETF shares, you can't participate in that. Mm -hmm. And then even if you say, well, I can sell the ETF shares and then I can buy the asset, great, you've run up the balance of this thing. You've been paying fees the whole way. Now you have to exit and now you have to pay a buy fee to get, you know, maybe fees come down at that point. They're not, you know, one, you know, they're not 1%, you're paying 0.25. But if your Bitcoin's done a 20 X, you're paying, you know, you're, you're paying a huge amount more than you would have paid just buying the asset. Um, and then obviously like, you know, Obviously, like confiscation, travel, all those things, like yeah. you don't get any benefits with the ETF. But even just the economic case, I think is incredibly clear. There's a it's like an embedded call option. When you own actual Bitcoin, it's like an embedded call option on the future of innovation because you can participate in those tools, protocols or services. And if you own ETF, you can't. That's that's interesting. I like that you, you sort of blew off the not that it's unimportant, but you blew it off the censorship resistance, all that, because if someone's looking at buying an ETF, that clearly isn't where they're care. at. Exactly. Yeah, they, 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 don't, they don't think their bank account's going to be frozen. They don't think, you know, I mean, that's the, the furthest thing from their mind. So yeah. I always try to like, I honestly shy away from always leading with censorship resistance, like, you know, kind of the freedom components um, I like to make a very strong economic case for Bitcoin of why you should own this. And then, and by the way, it protects you. Yeah. It's the only asset you can actually own. And it's the only thing that's going to protect you from the long tail of bad outcomes. 
you know, that's the cherry on top when I'm talking to the average investor. And and some Bitcoiners might hear that and they might think I have it ass backwards. It's not, it's not that's not represent like representative of my values. But if you want to get the next 30 percent of people to adopt the population to adopt Bitcoin, it goes back to your first question. They have a different set of concerns than you do. And no matter how much you think that's not right, it doesn't change it. Um, the reality is they are economically motivated and they live in kind of the normal world of outcomes where they're not a value. They're not like estimating a tyrannical wealth confiscation as a super high probability that they're planning around. Um, they may have some inclinations, and it certainly may be a positive that Bitcoin can protect against massive currency devaluation and confiscation. But my my belief is just that you're not going to reach 70% of people with that messaging. Um, and if you think Bitcoin is good, like if you think it is a moral good for the world and it is a moral good for people, then you want to reach, you want more people to benefit from this thing, which is good. And I'm just a believer that that is, that is the way in which one does that for the average person. So I'm going to ask you a, a, a dumb question, because I think this is something that a lot of people don't understand. If you have the ETF, is your only upside in, in dollars or do you have any sort of, is there an IOU on the underlying asset of Bitcoin? It's So it is backed by actual Bitcoin, right? Like we're not talking derivatives here, but mm -hmm. it is it is completely cash denominated. You are only going in as dollars and you are only coming out as dollars. At mm -hmm. no point can you take possession of the underlying asset. And um, even if you don't care about censorship resistance, I think there's an economic case for why that's the wrong choice. Right. Yeah. So, so the, the analogy that I, I like, I, I'm always looking for an analogy, like how can I simplify this for people? So tell me if this, I think I've shared this on the pod before. So the listeners, I apologize. Uh, so it, it would be like someone donating candles to Thomas Edison's lab and saying, Hey, when you figure this light bulb thing out, I want more candles back than I gave you. And it's like, like you don't want the candles, you want the light bulb. Like that's yeah. the, that's the thing. That's the tool. Yeah. That's the technology. Is that like maybe kind of a, a dumb, but fair way of, of describing like the, like, like your, your payout at the end is for this, this asset, if you even want to call it that, that has been highly devalued. And to your point, I think you, you, you've just made the best economic case, I think for Bitcoin versus the ETFs. Um, it's, you've also been paying an, an enormous fee. Yeah to take that upside in dollars and the, in these devalued dollars that you've earned. You're paying a huge fee to not actually own a valuable asset, which gives you utility. Like mm. it just doesn't make sense. It, or at least it's not optimal, right? Like, are there cases where people should own the ETF where they can only own the ETF where by regulation, they can only own the ETF. Sure. Of course. Right. But, um, you don't need to pay BlackRock a percentage of your Bitcoin every year to get less utility and value than you would just buying Bitcoin. Why do people do it? I think it's because they're intimidated of actually buying real Bitcoin. And I can understand that, right? Like that's not a foreign, that's not like incomprehensible to me. It can seem daunting at first. It can seem like something that is... um hard, new, uh, they don't understand it. But I think one of the messages that people in this industry need to have is that actually you can do it. It is easy. It is comprehensible. It's a lot like opening a brokerage account and then, you know, figuring out a new phone, like a new piece of technology. If you can operate a smartphone and you can log into an email address or a Fidelity brokerage account, you can self-custody Bitcoin. Yeah. You know, are there cases where it might be unsuitable for individuals based on the total risk pro profile of their life? Yes, there are. I'm not I'm not like a hardliner there. Like, you know, if you're. If you're like a digital nomad 
that gets wasted five days out of the week at some party in an underground European rave and you don't have a home to store your wallet in and your wallet's only on your phone? Like, what is the percentage chance someone's going to rob you? You know, it's higher than me, right? That's one example, right? Like situations aren't equal. It's a risk assessment. It's all a risk assessment. Like you take certain risks with a custodian, you take certain risks doing self-custody. If you have a very insecure life, well, maybe that risk is higher. But for I think for most people, um, you can absolutely do it very well. And um, there's tools to even do it better, like multi-sig, if you want a little, a little more redundancy and make it even more secure. Um, and you're going to get additional economic value. Like self-custody is cheaper. It's cheaper mm-hmm. in many ways. This episode of the Bitcoin Way podcast is sponsored by us, your friends at the Bitcoin Way. If you rely on a third party or closed source hardware wallet for your Bitcoin custody, you are compromising on how you store your wealth. The Bitcoin Way offers white glove service to help you take full self-custody of your Bitcoin and sleep in peace knowing you've done it right. Like most Bitcoiners, we believe that your Bitcoin stack will one day be worth a lot more than it is today. Go to thebitcoinway.com to sign up for a free consultation with a member of our team. Don't delay on protecting your wealth and reach out today. So how have, how have the ETFs, I want your opinion, uh, uh, so uh, don't forget, uh, just your opinion of the ETFs, what they mean for Bitcoin. But first, how, how have ETFs, if they have at all, changed the conversations that you have with clients? Like, are you discussing this a lot with clients or is it just like a, a sort of banter on Bitcoin Twitter? What's Oh yeah. yeah. Huge topic for clients. Um, what are some things I was surprised by? Some things I was surprised by is, um, I'll be honest, like when the ETFs launched, I was watching, um, like a Hawk, uh, private, right? I was wondering like, is it going to change? Are there going to be less leads? Are are people just got less people wanting to talk to us? Are people just going to buy the ETF? You know, um, I think none of us could fully know the answer to that question beforehand. You could, you know, you can make all the arguments you want for like spot Bitcoin's better. You should own the real thing, like blah, blah, blah. That doesn't mean it's what people are going to do. Um, and I was pleasantly surprised. Um, I was pleasantly surprised in that, at, you know, the number of people that are wanting to talk to us are higher than ever. Um, the number of people that are wanting to get exposure to Bitcoin, even in like retirement accounts where, you know, objectively it's at least marginally easier to buy the ETF. You're already with a brokerage. You just click a button. Um, a lot of those people, it's, it's, you know, record, record highs. Like they want to talk to us. They want to, you know, have these conversations, get the actual asset. And like I said, there's a strong economic case for doing so. I understand why they would do that. But it was it was interesting and compelling and 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 validating to see that people um, they're still very interested and the ETFs are a big point of discussion, right? These are like large, they're bullish, right? Like they're bullish for the price. You can't say otherwise. Like mm-hmm. you know, you can have a nuanced discussion on the risks and benefits of these things, but uh, incredibly bullish for the price and incredibly validating that after you know thirteen fourteen years. Um, that Bitcoin and Bitcoiners like won the ETF battle and, um, you know, and there's been such demand, there's been such interest from traditional finance. Um, just, it's a, you know, it's a huge story. It's a huge tailwind. It's something that's going to carry us, you know, it's going to be a very bullish factor for the next multiple years, right? Like, you know, GBTC is going to wind down like either, the, you know, it'll stabilize at some lower AUM or eventually they'll run out of most of it or they'll drop the fee to stem the bleeding. And then, my God, it's, you know, it's beautiful. And yeah. the thing the ETFs done, have done, like Corey, I think, articulated this the best. The top of funnel for Bitcoin was FTX, Binance, uh, Celsius, like BlockFi, blah, 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 Luna crypto dog like dog coins that was like the top of funnel that was how most people got involved for the first time and then maybe they make it down to bitcoin if they don't get their arm blown off on the way down Mm -hmm. right um we have exchanged 
SBF and Do Kwan and, and Celsius for Larry Fink and Abigail Johnson of Fidelity. Like, mm -hmm. and, and so that top of funnel, even if the ETFs get half of all the business, like of all the new people coming in, half they buy an ETF, the remaining half is going to be many, many, many times the size of the whole pie previously. Yeah. So, so safe to say your opinion is ETFs net positive, the mechanism by which they're probably a net positive is number go up. I mean, obvious demand increases and you couple that with something like the having, and yeah. uh, obviously there, there could be a, a big squeeze there. And also I think you raise a good point. The other mechanism is it changes the top of funnel. It's yeah. not, it's not scammers anymore. It's, well, you, you could argue, <laughs> make your argument about Larry Fink or whatever, but it's, it's not, uh, such obvious scammers, but it's, it's, it's the people who onboard mainstream into financial instruments to begin with. Yes. Is it? Okay. Yeah. With the biggest sales marketing financial machinery in the entire goddamn world. Like, I'm sorry, we haven't seen anything yet. Like this is their most successful product launch maybe ever, if not, you know, definitely in the last decade, like they're killing it. If you think the entire like behemoth sales marketing machine that is BlackRock and is Fidelity is not like, you know, it's like a big starship, like pivoting slowly right now, like turning. And it's going to focus on just ETF to everybody like that's what's about to happen. It's going to take six months to turn the ship, but the ship is turning. Um, and like, and the thing is, is like, okay, like I have criticisms of the ETFs. I, I was early that this was actually always the biggest risk factor. I think Bitcoin ban by government, not going to happen, was always super low. Um, people that over overestimate 6102 have no idea that FDR was a was a dictator. Like he had the most concentrated executive power that this country has ever seen. We live in a, a dispersed bureaucratic, like sclerotic state today. Like it's all just like these 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 uh, vultures picking the carcass of the US government. Like th th it couldn't be more different. Like it's ridiculously different. And the idea that this like decentralized infuting administration that we currently live with is going to organize sufficiently to engage in the largest scale public asset confiscation that we've ever seen, even though this asset can be moved with a click of a button to another country and is not concentrated in large silos. Like, no, dude, like that risk is super low. Uh, it's not zero, but it's super low. Um, and like I was early in in publicly talking about this, the real risk is that um, Bitcoin goes to a million dollars a coin, but nobody owns any Bitcoin. That's the real risk. It's everyone owns ETF. Everyone owns Wall Street Bitcoin. Everyone owns paper Bitcoin. Everyone owns like number like capture by number go up. I'm not saying that will happen. But I'm saying if you want to know which of these risk vectors I'm more concerned with, it is absolutely not 6102. And it is absolutely success, like failure via success, like mm. number go up leads to a compromising of the initial ideal of Bitcoin. Um, that is the one I'd be more concerned with. And I was early on kind of promoting that. Um, but I would also say that it's 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 nonsense. It's actually like it's incoherent to even really be like, oh, like are this isn't at you at all. Like I'm just the disc like like are ETFs good or bad? Are they like it's kind of irrelevant because there is zero pathways by which Bitcoin could ever achieve prominence where it didn't get an ETF along the way. Like it was always, always going to happen. You want adoption? Like this is like a fixed point on the way there. Like, you know, we either navigate it successfully because the protocol is sound or we don't. But like, you know, it's like, you know, you train your whole life, like you train for your athlete, you train for five years for a big race. And then you're surprised that you have to run a race. Like, no, like this is, this is the name of the game. Right. You know? Okay. So how do you think about 
where where the liquidity where the the value into bitcoin is coming from both today and in the future like it, who who's being robbed is it real estate is it you know equities is it government debt and 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 i, and I guess my my sense is because we're my my belief is we're so early in the adoption yeah. it's fewer people recognizing that bonds are on fire or that equities are overvalued but like today people are are going into the ETF are they just sort of rebalancing their portfolio and then in 10 5 10 years out wh where is this this money coming from yeah yeah so let me make just like a technical point first and th this doesn't this doesn't like override anything you said it's just like a bit of color um in a mechanical sense like the value doesn't have to come from anywhere, right? Like asset prices are a hallucination. And like you could pull out half of the dollars in NVIDIA stock and NVIDIA stock could be worth more if investors decide to start executing trades at 1500 a share because they believe that NVIDIA is worth more, right? Like it's not, it's not this like zero sum thing where like dollars have to actually come from somewhere. In, in just a broad sense, and I just say that for color, in practice, people do sell one thing and buy the other. Um, and I think what we're seeing right now, and I've talked with financial advisors and I've talked with uh, people at Morgan Stanley and like, you know, like I'm saying, hey, like, what are you seeing? And uh, they're getting calls from their clients, like boomer clients and wealthy clients and the clients are saying them because they can't solicit right now. Like there's a non-solicitation sort of clause around the ETF, which means let's say you work for Morgan Stanley. Like um, if a client asks you about the ETF, you can sell them the ETF, but you cannot ask the client about the ETF. And that's like the current state. Um, maybe that's, a, that's an internal, that's like at Morgan correct. Stanley. Yeah, 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 that's Morgan Stanley's role, right. right? Like, and many others, I would assume. I know for a fact with Morgan Stanley. Mm -hmm. Um I would assume it's very similar with many others. They're not going to be soliciting for a little while um, or maybe a while, um, but they can offer it now. Um, and so, but clients are coming to them. This is happening. They're saying, hey, what if I just put 1% in? Uh, what if I put 1% in? And so the answer to your question is they're selling stocks and maybe bonds. They're selling their kind of brokerage account portfolio, 1% and they're buying the ETF, right? Other people doing things different. I don't think it's, um, but like it's, you know, do I talk to people on a regular basis that have sold real estate and are buying Bitcoin with it? Yeah, absolutely. That, mm -hmm. That's been happening for a while. Um, you know, people with excess cash flows going into Bitcoin. Yeah, absolutely. People that have a big liquidity event, they sell their startup, they sell their business, buy a bunch of Bitcoin. Yep, happens regularly. Um, so I think right now, Bitcoin is so small and other asset buckets are so incredibly large. People really don't understand. Bitcoin's worth a little over a trillion dollars. There's $30 trillion of just residential real estate in the U.S. Just one country, you know, probably the biggest financial market, but one country, just residential. You add in commercial, that number gets way bigger. You add in Europe, you add Australia, China, uh, Japan. Just the real estate bucket is is massive, right? Then all the stocks, then all the bonds, then all the gold, like, right? There's, you know, orders and orders and orders of magnitude more wealth in the world that can be converted to Bitcoin than is in Bitcoin currently. And, and all the Bitcoin is worth. Um, but to your question as well, like, where does that value come from in the future? Um, I think... Bitcoin consumes monetary premiums, right? So you have assets. And so I think like gold obviously has the biggest percentage basis monetary premium. There's no quantitative way to like objectively measure that. But if you just ask the question, if gold was not treated as a form of money, what would it be worth? The answer a lot probably less. at least 80 or 90 percent less right yeah, like yeah. almost all monetary premium not industrial utility factor or like aesthetic concerns right there'd be some value left for sure but it'd be exponentially lower if it lost all of it mm -hmm. i'm not saying it loses all of it but if it did um but then you get into a more interesting question does real estate have a monetary premium 
I would argue absolutely yes, um, more than most other assets, because it's seen as this like de facto hard asset release valve for people's savings. Um, and that's been logical, right, for the average investor in the sense that like what made real estate nice is a it's a fixed fixed like you build more of it, but it you know, at any one moment in time, there is X amount of real estate and new supply can only come online so fast. It, it's not infinitely fast like fiat or shares. You can create infinitely more shares anytime you want, um, you know, without crashing the company. But like, you know, there's a there's a real estate obeys the laws of physics. Um, and but what made it really good was not just that kind of hard capacity, but it was that you got to borrow in a depreciating currency to buy the asset, right? It's the loan terms to real estate that made it a nice investment for people in that you could borrow in fiat and you can buy an asset. Your loan gets debased over time. You know, the amount you owe goes down while the value of your asset goes up. Um, and as such, it's served as this like really a store of value. Um, not just for Americans, but like, if you look around the world, like China, like real estate is the store of values. Like, actually, I believe this is true. I believe this is true. There may be a couple exceptions, but America is the only country in the world where people on, on an aggregate basis own more stocks than they do real estate. Every other country people save in real estate. So there's a massive monetary premium there. Um, I think there's also a monetary premium in stocks, particularly American stocks, particularly the big tech stocks, particularly the S&P 500. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just because you get, okay, let's, let, you know, let's go around the country. Let's give $100,000 to every like financially educated person that like makes investment decisions. What do they do with that $100,000? I think the number one thing they will do is they will buy the S&P 500 or they'll buy Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook, whatever. Um, and, and that's, you know, you're, you're not really investing at that point. And this is a really interesting topic that I think we should discuss more. I, I'm pretty strict with my def definition of investing. Um, and I would say that investing is buying and putting money into an enterprise because you think that one specific idea will succeed, that one company, that one concept, that one enterprise. Um, it is not this like spreadsheet optimization, back testing, investing is indexing across 500 companies. That's a form of saving that has been financialized. And what you see is that people just take this money and they put it in the index. It's not because they have a thesis that like Apple's going to succeed, particularly over the next 10 years, or it's valued in an attractive way right now, or they're really bullish on the Vision Pro and they think that this is going to like change the world. It's just like stocks go up, risk adjusted returns. Here's the money. Um, and so I see that as a form of monetary premium. It's, it's serving the function of savings for the average America, uh, American. And so I think, uh, the money comes from all those buckets. I think Bitcoin demonetizes, um, money substitutes. Interesting. Interesting. And, and I think it does make a lot of sense. So maybe last couple of questions I have for you, uh, or just last area of focus is you, see, you, you work with institutions as well, not, not yeah. only private. Yeah. So my understanding, I, I, I'm assuming you're working with like private, you know, small, mid-sized private companies or are you, are you working with Mostly. like, yeah, yeah. Mostly private companies, right? Like there's not a lot of public companies. Uh, the number isn't zero, but mm -hmm. there's not a lot. Well, th so the reason I was asking is I'm curious what what private companies are doing, what what their interest is, and I also want to hear your thoughts on. As I understand, I think it's it's FASB. There's some new rules coming out in December that will that are advantageous to a company holding something like Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Could you, it, it, to the extent that that's any part of your world, or you know much about it, or care to share? Awesome. But then, uh, yeah, maybe just tell me a little bit about the work you're doing with your institutional clients. 
So the FASB stuff only really matters in a big way for public companies. Um, and it only matters for private companies insofar as their capital providers care about it. And I would argue that like the average, uh, like if you're, if you're writing a startup or a small to medium business, a check, you don't give it like you're willing, you can just look at the balance. Like, you know, like it doesn't yeah. technically, you can't write it up on your earnings. Like that doesn't matter to private capital. Like they're just going to look past it. Um, it's it's FASB is more about playing within the sandbox roles for like public companies. Um, it's a big deal there, but it doesn't come up a lot like um, in our conversations with businesses and institutions. Um, first mover advantage is family offices. Let's be clear, like who's going to be the biggest early adopter on the institutional segment? It's family offices. And we work with a lot of family offices. Um, why? Because they have um, so it's the same reason MicroStrategy was the first company to adopt Bitcoin. It's actually the exact same reason. And so why is it going to be family offices? Because they have unilateral authority to decide what they invest in. Just like a founder-led company like MicroStrategy, of which there are vanishingly few on public markets. People think, why don't other people do the MicroStrategy thing? Well, I'll tell you a big reason, because they're fucking run by committees. And you're never going to get it through a committee or if you do it's going to have to wait until it's a normative de-risk thing it's like a principal agent problem these mm -hmm. these kind of bureaucratic institutions they're not they're not incentivized to take risk because they just kind of stay in the box don't get fired right like you're not you don't have upside from succeeding massively in in, in, a, in a way which outweighs the downside of doing something the board or shareholders or whoever doesn't like or the, you know, the index funds or, you know, Vanguard or whatever. And then you get a ton of shit and lose your position and like, right, like they're the, the bureaucracy keeps it all back. So, you know, to, to be one of these public companies that's going to take advantage of public debt markets, which is something that, you know, they have a unique advantage to do. Um, you need this kind of unilateral, like you need someone that's in charge that can just be like, this is what we're doing. If you don't like it, sell your shares. Right. Mm -hmm. But most companies cannot make that statement. Like Tim Cook cannot be like, I've decided we're going to keep our cash in Bitcoin. If you don't like it, sell your Apple stock. Right. Not going to happen. Not until the very concept itself has been de-risked. And as evidenced by Tim Cook owns Bitcoin personally. Apple owns zero Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's because you can't. Um, so yeah. the, 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 does does the FASB rules those changing? Does that at least so? So your contention is that doesn't really open a material path for most companies because they still are being run by committees and it's still Bitcoin still hasn't been adequately de-risked. Is that I would agree. I don't think the FASB is like a silver bullet that we okay. see this like huge wave of corporate adoption unless some the ETFs are more bullish for corporate adoption than FASB is. Mm -hmm. FASB yeah. is matters and it may be that people wouldn't be willing to adopt until FASB, but they're not going to adopt because FASB. Okay. Um, you need it to be where these officers can cover their own ass and aren't going to be seen as doing something uniquely risky that endangers the company. Yeah. And until public markets view Bitcoin ownership on the balance sheet, as uh you know not uniquely risky what's the other public company okay let's look at the public companies that own any bitcoin micro strategy tesla right elon runs fucking tesla and um cash app jack dorsey uh i don't know if he has like a voting super majority or whatever but like he runs it right he has a lot of influence there and so you know you see the, the three companies that adopted Bitcoin were three companies that have a very strong founder who can make decisions and override hand wringing on the hand of, you know, the board or shareholders or whoever. Um, and so you either need more companies that have that are founder led um, or you need um, 
you need it to become like socially de-risked. And maybe that's something that happens because of the ETFs and the subsequent waves of adoption. Maybe by the end of this year, owning Bitcoin is like owning S&P 500 index fund in some ways, or at least it's normal. Uh, and then maybe you might see some adoption, but um, I think that's the biggest thing holding it back. Okay. Hey, we're at the, we're about at the top of the hour. Do you have three more minutes or? Yeah, do you let's need go. Going? Okay. No so, so my last question on, on the, uh, on public institutional adoption, it, it, this is just more of a, a matter of curiosity. Do you think that game theory kicks in and let's say Apple for some reason does swing some level, uh, an allocation to Bitcoin. Does that put pressure on Google or my, like does game theory kick in other companies say, because a lot of those those CEOs probably understand Bitcoin better than the average person. They're smart. Yeah. They're technical. Might they say, okay, we we can't fall behind simply because we were slow to move on this. Do you think that plays any role? I think it does. And for the exact kind of inverted reason, the same reason that because they're so hamstrung by bureaucracy that they can't take unilateral actions for those exact same reasons, they are hopeless trend followers. Hmm. What Facebook has a metaverse strategy. Why don't you have a metaverse strategy? No one stops to ask if it's even valuable to have a metaverse strategy, right? Mm -hmm. Like the same reason you get like uh, witch hunted if you do something that steps outside of these norms, you also get witch hunted if you don't do the thing that everybody knows your competitors are doing, right? Oh, you don't have a you don't have a, an LLM model. What are you doing? Oh, well, you better get there. Like you know what I mean? Like. Shareholders are going to be like, where's your AI strategy? Where's your LLM, Apple? Like, where was your metaverse strategy? Oh, Apple Vision Pro. Well, you know, where's that going? I don't know. Um, if Apple buys Bitcoin, it turns from what are you thinking buying Bitcoin to how come you don't have a Bitcoin strategy? Right. Um, That's an, it, it, that could be an interesting story to play out in. I guess it, it'll be 2025 would be the beginning of it in all likelihood, because yeah. at least the rules would become favorable, you know, especially in a bull market. Yeah. Okay. Hey, last two questions, uh, just for fun. Uh, I, I wrote these down. Uh, would you rather give up your Bitcoin and stay in sunny Florida or move somewhere with 23 hours a day of darkness, but get to keep your Bitcoin? Give up the Bitcoin. Not even. <laughs> you couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Yeah. Okay. You know. Okay. And yeah. then la last one, just another fun one. Would you rather spend every day walking in darkness or have to sit no walking allowed in the sunshine? Um, so, so two universes, one where I get sunlight, but can't walk. And one where there's no sunlight, but I can walk. Correct. Sunlight and sitting. Okay. Yeah. That's a, I think that's a good answer. No. All righty. Steven, I, I threw a lot of curveballs in there. So I appreciate your, you being gracious and one of the more fun conversations I've had. I really appreciate you taking time and excited for you guys at Swan to see what uh, the rest of this bull market looks like. I can Absolutely. only imagine it's going to be amazing. Yeah, it's going to be a great year and uh, it's a good time to be a Bitcoiner. So, hey, let's give everyone a send off where to find you uh, yeah. or learn more about Swan. Anything else you got going on? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm on Twitter. I'm super active on Twitter. DMs are open. You want to reach out to me, Steven Lupka, just type my name in on Twitter. Uh, the one with like the, the blue check and the Swan signal, there's a million impersonators. Please, I'm never going to ask you about your trading or anything like that. Um, you want to find more about private swan.com slash private. And uh, yeah, reach out to me. One of those awesome. two places. Terrific. Steven, can't thank you enough for your time, man. Let's uh, stay in touch. Absolutely, Michael. Pleasure. Take, take care. And that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Steven as much as I did. He is such an interesting guy to talk to. So many passions in this world besides sun exposure and walking, of course, trying to fix this broken monetary system and bring the bright orange future to life. Uh, give him a follow online. He's got some great content. Check out Swan. They're doing amazing things and really working hard to onboard as many Bitcoiners as they can. And of course, if you need self-custody help with your Bitcoin, check out us, The Bitcoin Way. It's at The Bitcoin Way underscore on Twitter. You can check us out online at TheBitcoinWay.com. And of course, check out my Twitter account. It's at the other M Jordan. Shoot me a message. Reach out if you have any questions. Uh, I also have my own personal newsletter. It's uh, BlackHatBitcoin.Substack.com. 
and would love to hear your thoughts, comments, give this video a like, subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Fountain, wherever you're listening. If you enjoyed, we really appreciate the support. Until next time, this is Michael Jordan signing off.